Well, it's good afternoon when, of course, it should have been good evening yesterday. Unfortunately, I spent the whole evening、um, stationary on the A38 due to a rather unfortunate accident there. So we've just pushed the show back until Tuesday afternoon. Hopefully, this is a one-off.、Uh, in future, maybe I'll、um, leave a little earlier. Well, we've got a show for you today. That's for sure. It's been an amazing week of frackwits. But before we get on to the frackwits, let's、uh, just have a reminder as to why it is that the UK is on the brink of a potential fracking nightmare. If we take a look at the、uh, the screen here, what we see is that 64% of England sits above recoverable shale or coal bed methane deposits. The central belt of Scotland, right across、uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh, also the same. We have a government and an industry that is determined to get its bits in the ground, and as we're going to see over the next hour, the PR campaign is ramping up. We always expected that this would get ugly. Well, that's the start of things to come. So let's have a look at some of the prime areas that are being targeted here. So if we look at the screen again, what we see here are the primary focuses. Uh, we've uh, obviously had、uh, the attention of the media on Balkum in Sussex during the summer, and、uh, as we're going to see through the program, the attention is soon to switch back to the northwest as iGas Energy look to get their bits in the ground. But、uh, it's many other areas of the country that are also under threat, not least、uh, Humberside,、uh, the whole of、uh, Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, and the、uh, the West Riding. Uh, not to mention, of course, South Wales, where Gerwin Thwellin Williams, having been effectively kicked out of Somerset and Kent, at least for the time being, is now going to focus on Wales. And his lobbying there has been so successful that he's even managed to get the anti-fracking community to drop the word fracking from their campaigning. Something that I think they might need to revisit sometime very, very soon. Now it's been a busy week. Last、uh, last week、um, on Tuesday, I joined Gaza Frackman. We can get the picture up on the screen here. There we go, Gaza Frackman, along with、um, the dairy farmer Alan Pembleton from the Fylde Peninsula, and、uh, Louise from、uh, Frack Free Somerset, and Catherine from Frack Free Sussex. In fact, Catherine is a Balkan resident, and the four. Wonderful people here were at Ten、uh, Downing Street to deliver a letter to David Cameron, advising David Cameron that、uh, there was an increasing feeling right across the country that fracking was not a particularly good idea. And in fact, more of Gaza later because he is planning to deliver a letter to David Cameron every Friday for the foreseeable future until there is a change of heart behind that door. Unfortunately, of course, we couldn't get beyond the door, and、um, as we can see here, I、uh, did try and get through the door, but、um, unfortunately, that was about as far as I got. So I did actually get my foot almost in the door. But、uh, you know, could this be the global corporatists' worst nightmare? And just in case I ever get the other side of the door, of course, the chances of that are actually slim to none. But just in case,、um, you might want to see what my manifesto would be. So here's the manifesto for、uh, anybody who、um, thinks that I might get an opportunity to get the other side of the door. Of course, the party would be called Humanity because that would very much differentiate us from the non-human stroke inhumans who are currently the other side. So、uh, all of these, these、uh, first five. Policies would be implemented before lunch. The outright ban on hydraulic fracturing, an immediate implementation of a renewables energy strategy, the release of suppressed energy patents, the immediate nationalisation of all utilities, and the abolition of the fractional reserve. And the last one, of course, is pretty much to ensure that、uh, I probably don't actually see the end of the day. So anyway, meanwhile, we fight the campaign from the. Other side of the door, and after we'd、uh, visited number ten, then it was off to、uh, Piccadilly Circus to meet up with the Balkan Massive, and it was wonderful to see 
So many familiar faces there from the, uh, the Balkan campaign. And this was the precursor meeting before many of the group actually went off to join the Million Mask March, which of course was not reported in the mainstream media. And uh, this um, was uh, taken at Trafalgar Square. And so the Balkan Massive certainly making their presence felt there. Meanwhile, that same afternoon, two of our opponents, Andrew Austin from iGas Energy and uh, Francis Egan from Quadrilla, were in front of a House of Lords committee putting their case for accelerating the shale gas agenda in the UK. Well, sitting on the other side of the table with the Lords was none other than Lord Lawson. And uh, Lord Lawson is anything but impartial. And in fact, this is an article that he managed to uh, scribe for The Sun, the, um, the comic that is read by 13 million people in the UK. Unfortunately, it's absolutely essential reading, along with the Daily Mail, of course, because that way you know what 25% of the adult population of the UK believes to be the absolute gospel truth. So in this uh, article, Nigel Lawson is um, waxing lyrical about the benefits of shale gas and how we have to encourage the drillers to get their bits in the ground. But he also makes the classic statement of there is not a single case of contamination. Well, you know, cognitive dissonance. I'm beginning to wonder whether this is uh, some kind of mental illness or is it just industrial denial, institutional denial? Well, during the course of the discussion, um, Francis Egan and Andrew Austin made a couple of uh, statements that are very interesting. Francis Egan said, anywhere we drill, we will have to have the acquiescence of the local people. Getting local acceptance is a barrier. No, Sherlock. Well, the reality is that you do not have local acceptance anywhere you want to drill, Francis. Haven't you got the message yet? The people of the Filed Peninsula are basically running you out of the Filed Peninsula. You're desperately trying to get your bits in the ground in Singleton, just outside Portland of Filed. But the meeting of the Singleton residents later this week is uh, hopefully the first step to seeing you run right out of the Filed Peninsula. And as for Borkham, well, you signed a 30-year lease with Simon Greenwood, the somewhat less than transparent parish councillor sitting uh, around the table at Borkham. So you signed that lease, I believe, somewhere around about the 26th or 27th of September, just one or two days before your planning permission expired at Borkham and you had to scurry away and leave the pad empty. Well, it's very evident that you and Simon Greenwood have a very cosy relationship and it's very clear that you're planning to come back. Andrew Austin said, uh, all of us are aware that we have an uphill PR challenge. Well, we do too, actually, Andrew. So we're in the same boat there. I think we also recognise that we have an uphill battle. So, you know, we both have an uphill battle. So maybe you want to share notes with us and maybe we can talk about how we get our respective messages out to the wider populace. In fact, Andrew, how about we have a public debate? How about you and I give 30 minutes presentation to the residents in any location where it is that you want to get your bits in the ground. You can have your selected seconder and I will have mine. And then we'll give the residents the opportunity to grill us both. And of course, we will ask them all to have their iPhones on so they can check everything that we are presenting. And no doubt you will try and present just like Lord Lawson that there's never been any proven case of contamination. Well, Nigel Lawson also let it be known uh, where he stands, although there was never any real doubt, was there? What more can we do for you? What more can we do for you, Andrew and Francis, says Lord Lawson. Very clear evidence that the government is very much in the pockets of the corporations. Not that there was any real doubt about that, but interestingly, um, George Monbiot has actually finally realised that the global corporatists are dominant and not the British Parliament. 
You know, it's taken uh, George Monbiot a long time to realise what the supposed conspiracy theorists have been saying for years. Well, welcome aboard, George. Maybe you'll start to see the relevance of some of the other issues that we've been talking about. Fracking is just the thin end of a very, very big wedge. Well, meanwhile, meanwhile, what else has been going on? Well, we have some very interesting um, news. Uh, Brent Council. This is uh, Brent in North London. And I think I can. There we go. There's Brent. Brent. Now, Brent doesn't exactly have a lot of open land. It's only really parkland. But Brent has declared itself to be a frack free zone. Now, then they weren't under any immediate threat. But nonetheless, you know, this is a start and this is what we need to see, particularly in the light of Boris Johnson stating that he wants to frack under London. But uh, in addition to Brent, of course, we also have the Kent councils. This is Kent. And we see in the blue on the uh, right of the screen there, the um, uh, uh, I'll get the right teeth in here. Petroleum exploration and development licenses held by Coastal Oil and Gas, headed up by Gerwin Thuellen Williams. And the five councils, the parish councils that were being targeted by Coastal, have all stated that they do not want the bits in the ground in their parish. So Gerwin Thuellen Williams has uh, run away with his tail between his legs, but I trust this guy about as far as I can throw him over my shoulder. He did pretty much the same in, in um, Bath and Somerset last December when he made a big play about withdrawing his planning applications from the, uh, the county council. I believe that Gerwin Thuellen Williams has been tipped the wink and he's been told, don't worry, Gerwin, because we're in the process at central government level of removing all of the blocks that are put in place by local district and county councils. So it's very important that we watch this space. Now, what else is going on? Well, as I said, the PR campaign is mounting up uh, big time. And another visitor to uh, this country is a man otherwise known as the Frack Master. Now, Frack Master is actually a generic term. It's the term used uh, by the, the senior individual on a frack job. So quite possibly at some point in his life, this man has actually run frack crews. So he is directly responsible probably for the contamination of significant amounts of uh, water, soil and atmosphere in the course of his relatively short life. And um, here's one headline from the BBC that you're probably not going to see anytime soon. Frackmaster Chris Faulkner talks complete, and I'll leave you to add whatever word you want to the end of that. But um, one thing it's not is truth. This guy has been touted all around the country. Here's the Hull Daily Mail. Frackmaster Chris Faulkner says East Yorkshire should get behind fracking to keep the lights on. Then he was trotted out in Blackpool. Fracking should be part of the energy mix for Britain and the government needs to get on with coming up with clear regulation. So says US onshore gas tycoon. And no vested interest there then. And of course, he was also trotted out on Panorama. So, wow, the PR campaign is seriously ramping up big time. And um, as far as the British government is concerned, who's been champion, championing the cause this week? None other than Michael Fallon. Oh, it looks like we've got a bit of a, a problem on the, um, on the uh, graphics there. Michael Fallon, MP for Seven Oaks in Kent. Now, Michael Fallon is uh, a dual portfolio holder. He is the Minister of State for Business and Energy, reporting into the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. You notice they had to add the word innovation there because otherwise it would have been... Uh, rather a more uh, true statement, it would have been the Department of BS. He's also the Minister of State for Energy, um, uh, the uh, Department of Energy, Climate Change and Unconventional Gas and Oil, uh, the abbreviation of which is defecate you go. Well, Michael Fallon has uh, also apparently become a clairvoyant and he's been trotted out uh, by his boss, Ed Davey, who's the MP for Kingston and Surbiton in uh, Surrey. 
Uh, he's the Secretary of State for Energy, Climate Change and Unconventional Gas and Oil. And Michael Fallon has been trotted out to announce that a water report, which actually hasn't been published yet, says fracking is safe. Well, this uh, would be the same water authority that earlier in the year, of course, expressed their concerns about the fracking process. And here's the report. It says that opponents say water used in the process could be contaminated and could enter domestic supplies. But the UK water research industry, uh, sorry, water industry research, a research body set up by water companies, is to release a report by the end of 2013. So let me get that right. That's about oh, seven weeks away. So Michael Fallon has preempted a report that isn't about to be published for another seven weeks. And Mr. Fallon told the Daily Telegraph that while exploration has so far been focused in the north of England, areas right across the south and the Midlands could also be investigated. Mr. Fallon said there are genuine concerns, but there are also myths and we are tackling them. Yes, and the myths are the ones being perpetrated by you and your other cheerleaders. But the water issue could be the Achilles heel. You can't see this really on the screen, but I would encourage you to uh, go onto your computer and search for the Water Framework Directive. This is the Water Framework Directive of the European Union. And uh, what you see on the screen there is the relevant page from the Environment Agency and their introduction to the Water Framework Directive. Well, let's have a look at an extract from that because on that page it says... The Environment Agency is the lead authority in England for improvements on inland and coastal waters through better land management, protecting inland and coastal waters from diffuse pop, uh, pollution in urban and rural areas, driving wiser, sustainable use of water as a natural resource, creating better habitat for wildlife that lives in and around water, creating a better quality of life for everyone. Notice the emphasis is on the word water. And once you mix the frac fluid with water, it's no longer water. And that water is completely lost to the system. So the myths that are being perpetrated are very much coming from the government and from the likes of the frac master, who I'm sure didn't fly across to the UK out of his own pocket. And he hasn't been trotted around the UK to Hull, to Blackpool, to Borkham and on Panorama for nothing. I'm sure he's been paid very, very handsomely. Talking of which, just before we go to the break, those of us who are fighting this campaign against the global corporatists are doing this literally on a proverbial shoestring. The government and the industry have very, very deep pockets, and we really need your support to be able to ramp this campaign up particularly, as we're going to see in, later on in the show, with uh, iGas in Manchester coming on stream. So if you go to fracking, uh, frackingnightmare.com, you will see that on the left-hand side of the web page, there's the opportunity there for you to make a donation or uh, subscribe to uh, a monthly contribution. But uh, let me assure you that everything that is donated into the fracking awareness campaign is used to fight this abomination. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back after this. If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk or call 01626 337 531 to order your copy now. And welcome back to part two of Fracking Nightmare. So after that very quick roundup of the government and industry propaganda for the week, we're now going to turn our attention to not only what's uh, coming in terms of uh, the iGas campaign to get their bits in the ground at Barton Moss in Manchester, but also take a bit of a reflection as to uh, the Balkan campaign. 
Because let's make no mistake about it. The reason that we actually have a little bit more time to discuss this and try and raise awareness throughout the country is due to the phenomenal success of the Balkan blockade. A 66 day campaign to slow Quadrilla down to the point where they were unable to run their flow test. In other words, they were unable to actually carry out any frack. So we still have a situation in the UK where we are frack free for the moment, despite a government and an industry that is determined to change that very rapidly. Well, on the line with me, I have Rob. Now, I have a picture of you, Rob, here. And, or here, Rob, even. Gosh, my uh, mouth needs to get in tune with my brain. Um, so, Rob, we have a picture of you on the screen, and you seem to be sitting on some kind of metal cylinder. Um, can you uh, tell us what was going on here? Uh, yeah, that's at the Balkan site. It was uh, early in September. And as you probably know, there's all these trucks going in and out, supplying them. And we really wanted to show that they, you know, they can't just go on doing it and really want to raise publicity and show that things can be done in a more direct way. And one of these trucks came by and I just happened to be able to climb onto it and sit on the top. So there wasn't much premeditation and, um, here. It was uh, it was a pretty random act. Is that right? Uh, well, it was sort of um, planned in that, um, you know, there was obvious an opportunity there, the police... As the trucks come in, the police escort them and you get maybe a huge number of police around it. Sometimes you get 50 or 60 police just escorting a truck into the site, uh, outnumbering the people at the camp there and the protesters, but coming out, they'd sort of forgotten about that aspect. So it seemed we've got an opportunity just to make a little statement. Oh, excellent. And, and how long were you actually sitting up there? And I noticed that there's a D-lock around your ankle. So how, how long were you actually sitting on the top of the tanker? Um, well, I think it was probably two or three hours because um, it needed the, uh, you know, their little climb team to come and, and cut the D-lock off. And um, so it was an opportunity really for me to be there, said a few words to sort of a, some people with a camera. And I think the BBC were there as well which was good, so it got some publicity on that. Well, and, and, and you contributed to uh, two to three hours of the delay. And, uh, of course, all of those uh, respective delays added up cumulatively to the point where Quadrilla were not able to uh, achieve what they set out to achieve. Now, now Rob, um, the uh, detractors of the protection community have claimed that everybody participating in the anti-fracking campaign is either a professional protester, a rampant eco-mentalist, um, or a swampy. Uh, and that's just a few of the accolades that they, uh, they try and pour on us. Now, now, which of these categories do you fit into? Uh, yeah, well, I think none of them, basically. <laughs> I mean, the professional protester, um, I think that implies people just go on protests because they like protesting. But I, I, you could say, you know, some of us, me as well, maybe I'm a veteran. I, I've been protesting against this for a while. And the reason isn't because I like protesting, it's because we have still to achieve our objectives. Uh, if people are poisoning the countryside or ruining the planet, you can't just protest for a week and sit back. You have to see it through. And that's why, you know, I've been doing it for quite a few years now. And I'm not going to stop until... And you're, and you're a software professional, I believe. Is that is that right? Uh, that's right, yeah. I sort of work from home. I've got a little software company. So you have your own business? Yes, that's right. Okay, and, and of course, um, that actually is much more representative of the uh, Balkan protection community because whilst I was there, I was there for 29 of the 66 days. And uh, in the time that I was there, I met people literally from right across the social, political and philosophical spectrum and uh, you know, the vast majority of people were professional people who, like you, had done their research and recognised that this is an absolute abomination. Now, as you say, you've been on this uh, trail for quite some while, and uh, I actually discovered uh, this, Rob. And um, if you look at... I don't know if you, you can actually see the oh, screen. I can't see the picture. OK, well, what yeah. we're looking at here is a picture of Blackpool Tower. And uh -huh. right, right across Blackpool Tower are a couple of banners that says, uh, fracking is coming to the UK... Uh, we can stop it. Now, I believe that uh, you were one of the intrepid climbers that climbed Blackpool Tower and put those banners up. Uh, yes, it was, actually. Uh, I mean, that was, a, I think, two years ago now. 
but it was when fracking was just starting to be, you know, get in the news. And uh, actually, it was quite satisfying. Hopefully, it did help get get the publicity and get people, you know, concerned about it. And in fact, um, I mean, the main reason I did it then, I hadn't seen, you know, gas lands or anything. So I didn't know too much about fracking, but I knew enough to know that, you know, it's dangerous. I didn't need to see all these pictures of flaming taps and so on. It was just the mere fact that we are going to exploit huge quantities of fossil fuels in the UK when we should be switching to renewables is enough to actually take action. So are you uh, planning on heading north once um, I guess start uh, kicking off in Manchester? Uh, well, I, uh, I'd certainly go there and give them some support. I hope to maybe spend a few days up there. But, you know, I, I've got to work down here and there's things to do down here. But definitely wherever it's going on, I'm, you know, it's going to have my support in opposing this. Well, and, and of course, that is the issue. Um, you know, as you rightly say, you have to work. And, uh, you know, we, we know that there are many, many people who would dearly love to be at Manchester or dearly love to be out on the road. You're raising awareness around the communities about what fracking means and what it what damage it will do to their communities. And we, we know that you can't do that. We know that you've got to work, that you've got to put uh, food on the table and keep a roof over the head of your families. So for those of us who are totally committed to this and will not rest until this abomination is stopped in the UK, please consider putting your support via the, um, the Fracking Nightmare website and making uh, the donation on the left there. Now, Rob, thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, that with us. Um, I look forward to seeing you at Manchester sometime over the next few weeks. What I would say, though, is uh, wrap up warm. It's a lot colder in Manchester than it was at Balkham in the summer. Uh-huh. Yes, <laughs> it's going to be a different challenge in the winter. It really is. And, and so what would what would your um, what words of advice would you offer to the people of the north of England that are about to experience uh, what the people of Borkham experienced in the summer? Um, well, just to pick up on what you said about the whole spectrum of people, it needs all sorts of people. Like I have flexibility because I'm self-employed, but there were the locals helped. The locals provided strong support. They were working hard on, say, campaigning and sending letters to the Environment Agency deck and so on. There are the protesters at the camp. That's another aspect, and that's a very direct way of stopping things. And then there's the backup, just general support. There's RSD support. There's uh, frack off and so on. Just So there's a whole spectrum of people, things that people can do. And even if you can't get there, just writing to your MP, supporting petitions, it does help. It helps build up the whole, the whole message. And, uh, yeah, raising awareness in, in whatever way you can, um, holding uh, evenings with um, friends and neighbours, looking at uh, some of the uh, wonderful documentaries that are out there, um, especially the new UK documentary, The Truth Behind the Dash for Gas. Mm-hmm. Rob, I, I just have one other thing on. is that we're, we're all local as far as this concerned. Because most of the UK, huge areas of the UK are potential fracking sites. So, you know, even if you don't feel this is local to you, it could be one day. So, you know, we all we all need to get involved. Exactly. This is indeed a national issue. And um, uh, to add to what you're saying about, you know, people with flexibility. I mean, one of the people who I saw probably almost every day that I was at Borkham uh, was a lady by the name of Louisa. And she normally had her children in tow with her, her young children. But uh, whenever she had the opportunity, she would walk down to the camp and uh, ensure that uh, basically the people at the camp had everything that they needed. Now, uh, because of Louisa's commitments, uh, she couldn't actually join us on the show today. But she penned this email to me and she's addressed it to the Barton Moss residents. So this comes from the heart of the Borkham community. And I'd just like to read you this uh, message from Louisa. She says, hello, Barton Moss residents. I'm sorry I'm unable to speak to you in person today. However, I just wanted to share with you our experience in Borkham. I have lived in Borkham for seven years. I'm a conservative voter and I'm a mother of two young children. Quadrilla told us in December 2012 that they had no intention of drilling in Borkham. In May 2013, they announced they were coming. At that point, I investigated what drilling, stimulating and fracking meant. 
I spent time with all the agencies involved with the presumption that all would be okay and what people were making a fuss about nothing. What I discovered, not through watching Gaslands or internet searching, but by researching the planning permission and the regulations and regulators involved, absolutely shocked me. I spent hours lobbying all the agencies, my MP, signing petitions, trying to get the press interested, and no one, not even the local paper, was interested in hearing what we had to say. When the drilling rig started arriving past our primary school and through our village, I was horrified that after so many objections, it was still going ahead. I was totally amazed when I heard people had started turning up at the site to voice their concern. I was actually quite terrified. Could I join them? Did I feel strongly enough to protest with them? What did it all mean? I went to the site on the 25th of July and I couldn't believe the passion and presence and warmth that I discovered. These people weren't what I was expecting at all. They had come to the same conclusions as me about fracking and they were genuinely to voice they con their con they were there genuinely to voice their concerns. Believe me, when you hear that rig start drilling, no one would choose to sleep next to it on a verge next to a 60 mile an hour road if they were not 100% with the cause and dedicated to stopping it. Suddenly, the press arrived. We were able to highlight our local concerns about lack of baseline monitoring, trucks coming in past deadlines, and amazingly, the agencies started to listen. The baseline tests were released. The trucks were stopped. The trucks were stopped on Saturdays. But more than that, we were able to say this is bigger than Balkan. It is coming to you next. Prepare yourselves. Inform yourselves. None of this would have happened had these people not responded to our call for help. There are two choices here. You welcome the protectors, as we came to know them, or you welcome the drilling. It's your choice, which is worse. Six months ago, I could never have imagined writing this. I could never have imagined protesting about anything. Protesting doesn't mean getting arrested. Protesting means standing up for what you believe in, trying to make a difference, trying to make someone listen. You can make a difference. And I hope that you will be able to understand that the protectors can help you make that difference. Solidarity to Barton Moss from Balkan, signed Louisa. Let's take a short break. Sixty percent of the English countryside is under threat from fracking, a process which has transformed the landscape in many parts of the United States and Australia and contaminated the drinking water and air with highly toxic chemicals and gases. One in three hydraulic fracturing was using a carcinogen. So it really is a chemical cocktail that goes into the earth, of which up to 40% remains there. The grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and everything that was in the water was burnt. The MDs have been instructed not to report any negative health effects that they believe to be associated with living over a gas field. There's nothing inherent about the shale gas process that is going to lead to problems. Some of this material was actually taken to a large sewage treatment works, which had no capacity to handle radioactive materials of this kind. 800,000 gallons was dumped into the Manchester Ship Canal. 50 seismic events were recorded during just six fracking treatments. What is the minimum depth that the fracking will fracture? We can't tell you until we drill the exploration. Have you no was... idea whatsoever? Because it doesn't look like you've done your research. Shale gas is part of the future and we will make it happen. We are just numbers and we are sat on this rich vein of gas and they will do and say anything to get that gas out of the ground.
and welcome back to part three of Fracking Nightmare. Well, we've just heard from Rob, who was one of the very active protectors at the Balkan Community Camp. And now we're going to move our attention a little bit more to the north, to Barton Moss. And uh, just to uh, remind ourselves what that's all about, let's have a look there. What we see on the screen are the blocks of uh, petroleum exploration and development licenses held by IGAS, I being short for Ireland, but IGAS Energy. And as you can see, they uh, hold licenses that stretch right across from the Wirral, right across to just to the west of Manchester. And the Barton Moss site is right at the very eastern edge of their licenses. Um, as far away as they could possibly get from the high dollar footballers residences that they also have license to drill under on the Wirral. Uh, no doubt that some of those Manchester United, Manchester City, Everton and Liverpool players who live in that uh, beautiful part of the country may have something to say about it when the drillers move in. Or maybe they'll embrace them with open arms and we're going to rely on the rest of the community. Let's narrow it down a bit. There we see this is the right at the very eastern edge of uh, iGas's um, licensed area. And right in the centre of the screen there, we see Barton Moss just to the northwest of the A57 and just to the southeast of the M62. And the actual um, pad is right adjacent to the M62. And just across the other side of the road, there is a beautiful property for sale. Now, this, this property is on the market for £975,000. And it sits within about 500 metres or so of the iGas pad. Now, I went uh, to visit the uh, owners of um, Brighton Grange Farm, as it's called, on Saturday. Let's have a look at what happened. So this is uh, Ian R. Crane uh, outside Brighton Grange Farm. Now, this is a beautiful property. It's on the market for £975,000. Unfortunately, it lies within about 100 metres or so of the M62 and within less than 500 metres of the iGas pad where they plan to be drilling an exploratory well looking for coal bed methane, so they say. We know they're really going for the mother load in the shale deposits below the coal seams. Now, I have um, been knocking on the door here because I came along today to make these people an offer. And I was going to offer them £9.75 for this uh, beautiful property um, on the basis that if IGAS do actually get their bits in the ground in 20 years time, these people would be very, very happy with the offer I've made them. Alternatively, of course, this is not going to be an asset. This property is going to become a financial millstone because it will be completely unsaleable along with the vast majority of other properties in this area. So sadly, Brighton Grange Farm doesn't look like it's going to be changing hands anytime soon. Well, having uh, come away from Brighton Grange Farm, uh, unfortunately, my offer of £9.75 was almost immediately gazumped as one of the other protectors offered a tenner. Well, as like I say, in 20 years time, they may actually come to realise that that was a hell of an offer because otherwise they're going to be stuck with this millstone around their necks, just like a significant number of people in the Fylde Peninsula who would dearly love to move. But the property market just isn't changing hands any anyway soon. Now, um, there was a reference at the end of that short clip to a website. And that website is wrongmove.org. So if you go to www.wrongmove.org, as opposed to rightmove, and uh, this is a website that I believe has been set up by uh, Greenpeace, and you can punch in your postcode there, and you can see if your property or your postcode is under potential threat of being fracked. 
And unfortunately, the postcode around uh, Brighton Grange Farm, which is, I think, M67RR, I believe it is, off the top of my head. Unfortunately, there are red flags all over the place. Now, I have to say, I have to say, £975,000, I think they know they're never going to sell it. I think they're hoping that uh, maybe they can get iGas to sort of cough up and, uh, and actually uh, probably drill on that property. And this is going to be the problem. This is going to be a real problem as this industry kicks off because people are going to realise that the value of their property is basically zero and they're just not going to be able to sell them, period. So consequently, what happens, and this is the same in the US and in Australia and in Canada, the gas industry comes along, knocks on the door and says, boy, have we got a deal for you. And unfortunately, and I completely understand it, unfortunately, people looking at the option of either being stuck in a house that they know they're never going to be able to sell to uh, accepting the money from a gas company that wants to use the property to drill. It's very, very tempting. But, you know, we have to stand up to this. I mean, hopefully, you know, people will recognize that if they take the gas company pound or dollar or euro, they are actually participating in a process that ultimately is going to contaminate the water, the soil and the air of this country. You know, when we have the delusional uh, individuals like the frack master, when they make observations like there are 25,000 wells on the shale where I live. We have drilled under the University of Texas in Arlington and even under my home and I still drink the water there. Well, you know, this is unfortunately, it's, it's obfuscation because the wells that are drilled in Arlington, Texas are not shale. They are conventional geology. And these are the lies and the deceit trotted out by the apologists in an attempt to convince people that there's no issue here. And, and when there are issues, we can rectify them. Actually, you know, this um, delusional, cognitively dissonant CEO of uh, Breitling Energy actually acknowledges. He says, yeah, of course, there can be problems. There could be problems with anything like getting on a plane when you go to Gatwick. But none of these problems actually come anywhere close to uh, being compared with the abomination of unleashing literally millions of gallons of toxic fluids into the geology and setting off the time bomb that uh, enables them to eventually percolate through to the water supply, up through the soils and into the atmosphere. Now, Barton Moss. Yes, I was there at the weekend and boy, was it cold. I made a mental note to myself that uh, I need to take warmer clothing and uh, also acquire a uh, winterized uh, sleeping bag. Well, the area is definitely being prepared for the arrival of the protection community. And uh, this is the bridge across the M62 with these uh, delightful barriers um, extended up there on the railings, probably to ensure that uh, the protectors don't um, jump off onto the motorway like they would. But uh, a little refinement has been added to these fences since I was last in the area. As you can see, gates have effectively been added either side of the bridge, thus creating the perfect kettle. So it seems that the Manchester police, or it could just be IGAS thinking ahead and trying to help out the local police, who will be there not as peace officers, just like at Balkan, the Manchester police and any other police force that comes into uh, Barton Moss to facilitate eye gas uh, drilling operation, they will be there to ensure that the corporate agenda is allowed to progress unhindered by the masses who are starting to wake up to the realization that there is a government in office that certainly does not have their best interests at heart. So, so much for the greenest government ever. Mm, I don't think so, especially when Michael Fallon is now talking about shutting down planning permissions for wind farms and solar farms so that the shale gas industry can become dominant. Well, here's the other side of those gates. This is looking towards the, um, the entrance into the iGas site. 
and uh, the security guards there were very shy. I tried to uh, encourage them to come out and talk to me and engage in conversation. But it does seem that the security guys at uh, Uniquin have been very carefully selected so that they are not able or willing to participate in just general conversation, basically. So this was as close as I got to the uh, security guys at Uniquin. As you can see, they're quite shy. They've installed this grill behind their inner doorway uh, so that they can um, keep themselves safe from a protection community that is intent on peaceful protection of this country's water supply. You know, what's occurring right here is outrageous, completely and utterly outrageous. And that's why, you know, we need people now to start coming to the Barton Moss area from right across the, uh, the country. And um, in fact, here is the extent of the Balkan, sorry, the Balkan, the Barton Moss camp right now. Oh, no, we got, let's find it. There we go. So on the left there, we have the Reverend Gary. Now, the Reverend Gary uh, turned up in his uh, camper van and with his dog a few days ago, and he's camped out there just a, uh, about a few hundred yards from the I guess entrance. And it's thanks to Gary that we've been getting uh, updates and reports on the truck movements. And the truck movements are certainly increasing. I guess are uh, building, still building their pad, but um, it looks like they could be on track to bring the, the rig in many times from a few days to a few weeks. So we have to monitor this very, very closely. I mean, obviously, the moment that the first truck rocks up with the rig on it, that is the cue for everyone who is interested in protecting this nation's water supply to rock up to Barton Moss and establish the Barton Moss Protection Camp. You know, I know that uh, the local groups are already holding discussions as to how they can support the people that come into the protection camp. And of course, the reality is that the people who live in and around Barton Moss, they're not going to camp. We understand that because they can go home to uh, their nice warm bed and, uh, and a bath. And uh, hopefully the people in Barton Moss, like at Borkham, you know, will uh, take some of the protectors under their wings and offer them the occasional hot meal and uh, hot bath and get to know the protection community. Because as you heard Rob say, and uh, Louisa acknowledge in her letter, it is not the usual suspects. It will be people coming in from all over the country who are determined to ensure that this nation's water supply is protected for future generations. I sent out a, a tweet earlier today just asking, you know, whether the attitudes of the likes of the Frackmaster and Michael Fallon, I mean, is this, is this just cognitive dissonance, institutional denial, or a form of mental illness? I'll leave the question out there. So, just a, just a reminder, here's where you need to be heading, um, or watching for the call. If you check the uh, Facebook page, No Fracking at Barton Moss, or words that effect, just uh, put uh, Barton Moss into Facebook and you'll find the page. And um, no doubt you'll find the information that you're looking for there. Uh, and also, you know, stay networked. Also check in to the website of the Northern Gas Gala. The Northern Gas Gala. This is a, a local group that are monitoring the situation and these people will be putting the word out as soon as the first rig truck arrives. Meanwhile, this is what you're looking for, of course. Let's uh, just take a look here. All eyes on the road for this. This was the first uh, rig delivery at Borkham. This was what triggered the um, mass migration of the protectors from all over the country to Borkham. Uh, tragically, when the second um, uh, delivery arrived, there was an incident with the brakes, uh, which meant that the truck was stuck outside the entrance for about five hours. And that uh, pretty much set the scene for the next um, eight weeks or so. Well, yesterday, unfortunately, a little bit of um, bad news or not so good news. The Royal Courts of Justice 
Lady Justice Lang ruled that uh, the people remaining on the verges at Borkham should be evicted. Now, this is a very interesting ruling because as I understand it, what this effectively does is it gives West Sussex County Council like an ace card. Now, it's up to West Sussex when they play this ace because I have been advised, and I'm assuming correctly, but I have been advised that this application only refers to what is happening right now. But they do have the opportunity of not using that ace right now and holding on to it for a later date. Now, this is the, going to be the, uh, the dilemma here. Will West Sussex County Council use it to evict the existing vigilance camp? Or will they hold on to it and use it once Quadrilla actually return? Of course, we have um, probably about another three, four months before Quadrilla do actually return, either in the, uh, probably in the, in the spring of uh, 2014. So we have another few months to ensure that uh, we do everything we can to raise awareness right around the country to remove the social license. Now, remember, Francis Egan and Andrew Austin, when they were in the Lords last uh, Tuesday, both stated that they need, they recognise they need to get that social licence, which means public apathy, to be able to move into an area and to get their bits in the ground. You know, I think we also need to put a little bit of focus onto Seven Oaks, because this is Michael Fallon's constituency. And I think it's about time that we put some concerted effort into raising awareness in Michael Fallon's constituency where, by the way, he has said that, oh, if the people object, then they won't be coming into an area. Well, this is um, a classic case of politician speak with forked tongue, as of course they always do. But in reality, what's happening is the politicians are being told that they can tell their constituents that they are against the fracking industry moving into their community, but they still support the overall government policy. Now, this should not be tolerated. The reality is that if the party line, and by the way, it's every single party, with the exception of the Green Party, every single political party is pro shale gas fracking. So every single political party is determined to either not do the research or having done the research to support an agenda that will effectively decimate the ecology of this country. Are we going to tolerate this? I don't think so. So let's see how that unfolds in, uh, in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, back in the File Peninsula and Quadrilla are going to focus their attention on the little community of Singleton. And so the challenge now is for the community uh, of Singleton and the surrounding areas to come together to resist Quadrilla, who have effectively been run off from every other area that they've tried to get their bits in the ground uh, in the File Peninsula. But of course, this is um, Lord John Brown's company, the man of dubious integrity. So uh, he doesn't really care what the locals think. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got to keep moving in that direction. Now, Gazer Frackman is the prime or one of the prime movers in one of the, um, I think, five, if not six anti-fracking groups that are springing up in the File Peninsula. And Gazer is coordinating the delivery of a letter um, trying to advise David Cameron about the growing awareness of uh, this agenda around the country. And uh, Gazer has just sent me a, um, a text. And what he says is, we need campaign groups from around the UK to sign up to take our fight to the doors of Downing Street. We need uh, at least four people from various groups to commit to coming to London on any one of the upcoming Fridays to drop a letter to David Cameron. And if you're interested uh, in joining Gazer in that part of the campaign, then do please contact him directly. You can either uh, contact him on um, email, which is info at fracfreefiled.com. That's info at fracfreefiled, and filed is spelled F-Y-L-D-E. 
or you can contact him directly on his mobile, which is zero seven seven six one five four four one seven nine. And、uh, yesterday,、uh, Gaza shared with me that、um, one of the supposed groups that is、uh, supporting the anti-fracking community has actually denied Gaza, one of the leading anti-frack campaigners, any financial support. Now, you know, I have to be、um, careful what I observe here, but you know, I've seen this with previous campaigns that there are groups that are set up. To literally funnel funds away from the people who are really making a difference, and then to distribute them to groups that you know, make a little bit of a contribution. So you know who I'm talking about. So revisit Gaza's request for financial support because he has been on this case ever since his house was damaged by the earthquakes caused by Quadrilla in 2011. Meanwhile, everything that is donated towards the fracking awareness campaign via frackingnightmare.com will go to raising awareness and to supporting those individual campaigners who are right out there on point, making a real difference. Now, just very quickly before we、uh, bring the the show to an end here, I just want to remind you that、uh, this. Is a quote that I showed a couple of weeks ago, and it's from an insider in the oil industry. Water is the lifeline, and water is going to be more expensive than oil soon. Water conversa-、uh, conservation, storage, and water-related businesses will gain more importance very soon. Now, in the last two weeks, I've been doing a lot of research into the oil industry's agenda. To effectively take control of global water, and they are doing it in collusion with governments and banks, because they're beginning to realise that they may be in the final days of their hydrocarbon hegemony, and this gives great concern to governments and banks, because taxation on hydrocarbons is the fastest way to fleece people of their disposable income after income tax. So let's make no bones about it that ultimately this agenda is about control of the greatly reduced fresh water supply on the planet. And as I have said many times, and I will say many times again, I'm sure in the coming months and years, if somebody wanted to poison the water supply of this planet, I cannot think of a faster way to do it than high volume, high pressure hydraulic fracturing. I have one event, one more event coming up at the moment before the end of the year. This will be the 92nd Fractured Future presentation that I have delivered this year, and uh, this is uh, this coming Sunday at the new Oriel Hall at、uh, Brook Blees Buildings in Lark Hall, just a little way to the north of Bath. And also, finally, I would absolutely recommend the DVD. Uh, it is available on、uh, YouTube. You can find this on YouTube. But by purchasing the DVD, you're providing a little bit of financial support to the filmmaker Marco Jackson, who invested a significant amount of his own resources to ensure that this superb documentary got out to the wider public. And we know it's being shown around communities right around the UK, and it's getting rave reviews. Everything in it checks out. It's a great documentary. Thank you for joining me this week. Sorry the show was delayed. I hope everyone that was involved in the accident is okay. Unfortunately, I think that's probably not the case. So、um, see you next Monday, nine p.m. God willing.